Welcome to Community Homeworks Workshop this evening. We're glad you're joining us. My name is Tiana Harrison and I am the Education Coordinator here at Community Homeworks. If you're watching this live, please comment to let us know where you're tuning in from. Also, if you would like to join the live discussion or ask a question, please put that in the comments as well. If you're watching this after the live broadcast, we are still happy that you're here and you can still ask questions in the comments section, but it might take a little longer for us to respond. Community Homeworks is a nonprofit organization with the mission to empower homeowners to maintain safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. We get our funding from grants, gifts, and donations. So if you find value in this workshop tonight, we encourage you to donate on our website, communityhomeworks.org. Tonight's workshop is ventilation and air conditioning, and our instructor is the infamous Lee Taylor. Thanks for being here, Lee, and we look forward to learning more about ventilation and air conditioning. Oh, it's me now? It's all you. Okay. <coughs> all right. So, ventilation and air conditioning uh, is closely tied to, which one am I looking at? That one or that one? I'm looking at you. <laughs> it's closely tied to, with uh, heating uh, systems also, but you know we had to break this class up because there's just so much to go over. So I want to go over a few basics on uh, ventilation and air conditioning with you. So when I'm talking about them, it makes a little more sense. I'm going to start with the furnace itself. So he said this is a typical uh if you have central air and we'll be talking about central air right now this is a typical central air unit uh what you have is you have the uh cold air duct uh this is bringing in air from this way there's a return air on this one it's on the side uh usually uh the return air is somewhere in the house and it could be a central return being a large grate similar to that it could be small grates uh whether they're on the wall or on the floor or in the hallway, something along that line. But it, it's an area for to collect that warm air in the house. So warm air is collected, it's brought into the return air, runs down through like this. See little arrows on there. Runs through your furnace filter. And like I said, there's a lot of different styles of furnace filters. We'll talk about those. That air is run through there, cleaned. There's a blower motor down here, and that's what actually moves that air. That air is moved up through what is called an A-coil. And this is basically a, uh, basically it's a refrigerant unit that has uh, refrigerant running through it. As that air passes through, it cools it down, and then it's delivered throughout the house through trunk lines and supply lines in each room and stuff. So it's that, it's that cycle of air it's, uh, as it's you know moved through the house. Um, we're gonna get into this a lot more in a little bit. I do wanna show you some other things. The ventilation side, the two work together pretty much. Um, this is a crude drawing of a house, but uh, the reason I'm showing this is that this is your typical, pretty typical house. You have your soffit area right here, and you have your attic space up in here. This is your insulation. Um, hot air is, you know, builds in that attic. That attic can get easily 120 plus um, degrees. 
So the ventilation side brings in fresh air through your soffit and it lets hot air escape out of uh, whether it's a ridge vent or whether it's a turtle vent or something along that line. It's letting that hot air out. That's important uh, as far as if that hot air builds up too much, it's going to push through the insulation and down into your living space. So, but it, with, with this, you have to think of it as hot air is going to go from hot to cold, kind of in that direction. So the reason I say that is, let's say you're running air conditioning, right? Let's say inside the house is 75 degrees and outside the house is, oh, let's say 90, right? So what's happening is, is that that hot air is pushing through your exterior walls and pushing into that colder space. Winter is different. It's flip-flop. So uh, there's a reason why that's important also. You have insulation up in the attic, and like I said, that attic can get extremely hot. So what's going to happen is if you don't have good ventilation in your attic, I don't care how much insulation you have, the R value is only going to slow that heat transfer down. And that hot air is eventually going to work its way down through that insulation. The more insulation you have, the longer it's going to take. But this is why it usually, oh, around four or five in the afternoon is when you start really feeling that uh, the temperature goes up. You know, that house is at a cooler temperature. That hot air is trying to push its way into that warmer environment. So there's just a few things just as far as understanding that sort of stuff that's going to help with some of the stuff I'm talking about. So the other part of the air conditioning is this is what you're going to see, like I said, inside the house. If you have central air, uh, you have the first part is the A-coil. Second part is the condensing unit. Uh, this is a pretty pretty typical condensing unit. Uh, it's a little dirty. Um, what this is doing is, is it's bringing that hot refrigerant, in a sense, through, running it through coils. It's pulling in air through. This fan right here runs, and it pulls air through, and that air cools that refrigerant back down. That cold, in a sense, cold refrigerant is run back to your A-coil. So you're going to notice that outside you have lines here. So you have, usually have copper lines. This one usually has like an insulated pipe, uh, sleeve over it. And this is your low side line. This is what's going back to the A-coil. Then you have a high side line. That's what this one is. Um, this is bringing that, in a sense, that hot refrigerant to this condensing unit. So, like I said, it's a, it's a loop, it's a cycle um, that makes it so that it can cool that house down. So what can make that air conditioner not work? Well, there's a couple things. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with what's inside. So one of the biggest, I guess one of the biggest things that's gonna make uh, usually that air conditioning not work properly is the air filter and in this place like i said right here this is this style air filter and like i said they come in all different sizes we'll get to those in a minute if that air filter is clogged what it's not going to be able to do it's not going to be able to pull that air through that filter this one's nice and clean you can see that but if it's clogged up with who knows what yeah, crud, <laughs> whatever. Uh, what it's going to do is it's not going to move enough air through. And what that does is it doesn't take that cold. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't strip that. It doesn't let the air strip that uh, cold out of that refrigerant. So what happens is the refrigerant here is not, in a sense, warming up enough. By the time it gets back to your condensing unit out here, this thing starts to ice up. So that is usually one of the biggest issues. There's other issues that it causes also. Um, so, you know, one of the things you can do uh, to be able to make sure your 
your air conditioning is running properly, probably the simplest thing is, is change that furnace filter out. Um, let's say your, your, your furnace is not, your, your air conditioning is not necessarily running all that great. You know, it doesn't seem to be cooling the house quite down like you want. Walk outside if you have central air and look at this. Uh, what you want to do is, A, you want to make sure that it's clear. So a lot of times these sit off to the side of the house. They kind of get forgotten. You get plants and whatever else that grows around it. Um, and if it's blocking that air moving through, it's not going to be able to cool that refrigerant down. So you want a good, clear space around this. Some people will put uh, fabric down and like stones around it so they don't get weeds and whatnot growing up next to it. But you want that clear. You know, you don't want things all around it and everything else. You want that space for that air to be able to move through and cool that refrigerant down, like I said, all the way around. The other thing is, is if you come out and you notice that this is icing up and it's usually going to start icing up near this area right here. But if you notice this is icing up real bad, that's usually an indicator that usually one of two things. Usually the furnace filter is either totally clogged up or your refrigerant levels are low. So, that, I mean, before you start calling somebody to come out and take a check, uh, you can always check your furnace filter and get that replaced out so that that air can move through. And a lot of times that's about all you need to do. Like I said, furnace filters, a lot of different styles out there. Uh, you have, you know, your four or five inch. You have your one inch. I'm going to pick on the one inch because that's usually the most common. Uh, the, yeah, those are nice also. The thing with furnace filters is you have a lot of different styles. So the first thing you're going to want to know for sure is the size of your furnace filter. This is a 25 by uh, 20 by 25 by 5. Uh, that's real important because, again, if you're losing, if you have too small of a furnace filter in there, uh, it's going to let all that contaminant run through and then clog up your air coil. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So first off, you want to be the right size. Second off, you want to think about what, uh, you know, what you want to be filtering out. There are a lot of different styles. Uh, this, this style right here to me is about right. Uh, this is a pleated filter. Uh, you can see that, you know, basically you just get more material into a smaller space by these pleats. You can see this one. These pleats are closer together, meaning that there's more surface area. Uh, meaning that it can catch more. And then you get into the, you know, how much can it stop? You know, well, this one will stop pollen and mold spores and dust mites and all that sort of stuff. So you want to kind of think about what you're going to need. Because this is the same sort of thing you would think about if you're in the heating system or in the heating season. So you want to you want to pick the one that works out best for you. When you're putting it in, what you're going to want to look for, and I will pick on this guy right Hill, there's usually a little arrow, and that's denoting the airflow. So with this one, you always want to make that arrow nine times out of ten pointing towards the furnace, um, or in the direction of the airflow. That's the way. Another way to think of it. Uh, the reason is is that you don't want to have, uh, you know, if you have this side exposed. You can see how this side doesn't have anything on it to protect it necessarily versus this side it has a metal mesh and plus this cart this uh, cardboard and stuff uh it makes it so you're not sucking things into your blower motor which is down here so you always want to have that arrow in the same direction as your airflow as far as changing that furnace filter it sort of depends big ones like this can go for you know six months to a year and this sort of depends as far as what's going on inside your house. Um, these, I have a tendency to like to change these about every 30 days of operation. And what I mean, what I mean by that is it's not every 30 days, but it's every 30 days that this blower motor right here is actually running. So uh, you have, sometimes you have uh, thermostats, we'll get to those in a second where you can turn it on, where you're not running your air conditioner, but you're actually just moving air. At that point, it's moving air through that filter, and that filter is 
time is ticking away. So you want to be able to check that. Uh, like I said, that's usually the biggest killer of either air conditioning or heating. It doesn't really matter. Uh, is a dirty filter, and that's usually the best thing that a homeowner could do uh, is be able to check that filter. So roughly 30 days of operation. This one, six months to a year. Uh, and it, again, it depends. So usually what I'll do is I'll have a, a few extra of these. I'll set them up here, and I'll make it so that I'm not having to run to the store and everything else or keep forgetting about it and everything. So you know, I'll buy like packs of four or something like that for ours. And change those out as need be. The uh, the other thing with uh, furnace filters is you want to shut this down. Now with this style, this is not that big a deal, but some styles drop in like this, and they can be relatively tight. And what can happen is, is if this motor is running here, uh, you can actually tear pieces and chunks of that furnace filter out. It will get sucked into your blower motor, throw it off balance, and then it's not good news. Uh, it can actually break things. So uh, what you're going to want to do is shut down that furnace. If you're not sure, this one here has a switch. Sometimes on the side, there's a little switch. Uh, there may be what looks like a light switch. There may be something that looks like this. It has a little fuse, a little switch. So if that thing's running, just shut it off. Let that, let that uh, air stop moving. And then go ahead and change that furnace filter out. Um, do an inspection on that furnace filter when you pull that out. Again, if you're seeing pieces, you know, let's say you pull it out and you got, you know, it's one of these sort of things, right? It's all ripped and you get pieces and parts missing. Well, there's an indicator that you yeah, might want to take a check and see uh, what's going on. You never really want to stick your hand in there. So at that point, usually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the breaker box. I'll find the furnace and I'll shut that power down and I'll get in here. And sometimes all you need, uh, you can just see it, you know, but you want to be careful that you make sure that you don't have pieces and whatnot getting into this. And if you're not comfortable with that, you can have somebody come out and be able to check that because uh, what it will do is it'll off, it'll uh, screw up that motor, it'll throw it out of balance and then tear things up. So like I said, when you pull that filter out, make sure that uh, there are no pieces and parts left over in that uh, in that blower motor. And then go ahead and put your new filter in and put your door back on. And go ahead and turn that filter or turn that air, uh, turn that air conditioning back on again. So That's usually the easiest way to be able to change that furnace filter out. And like I said, that's usually the best thing that uh, a homeowner can do outside of the condensing unit outside, keeping that clear, uh, keeping that relatively clean. You can see how this one is dirty. So this sort of stuff, yes, you can get a garden hose and kind of spray it off and whatnot. Um, the trick is you don't want to be pressing this sort of junk deeper into those fins because these are metal fins with a little spacing in between that pipes running in between it if you were to look at these real close you'd see that you don't want to press all this stuff further into those fins because it's just going to clog it up more so if it is really dirty this is one of those things where you'd want to call somebody out and what they'll do is they'll shut power down to this thing and they'll actually clean it out uh, from the from the inside blowing water out through this way. I <laughs> don't fully suggest doing that on your own uh, because, you know, this big motor and the fan blade and everything else is here. You have to make sure there's no power to it, and you have to take this top off to be able to get in there. It's not a good idea to be holding this thing, and all of a sudden it kicks on. So, it, you, well, yeah, it's, yeah. These are also sharp. So that's the other thing is I've seen people where they go in here and they try to scrape this stuff off. You will slice your fingers up quick. Now, doing a quick rinse, like I said, if you're doing a rinse like this, you're holding that angle down like this just to kind of knock this stuff off. Or you get like a, 
old paintbrush or something along that line, just to kind of knock that stuff off in between, uh, in between uh, services and stuff. There's nothing really wrong with that. Uh, it does depend on what kind of what you have going on around your house. Sometimes you, we, like in our area, we have cottonwoods. And depending, you can have fuzzies that look like snow and it's this deep. And they love to kill these units. So, you know, if you have that situation where you walk out there and it looks like this giant, white, weird looking bunny in your yard, you might want to, you know, shut it down and clean it off and stuff because it's going to make it so it's going to work a little bit better. Um, so it depends on, you know, that. But like I said, that yearly maintenance, uh, as far as a person that's licensed and insured, uh, they can come out. And yes, they're going to usually do a cleaning on this sort of thing. They're also going to hook up gauges to make sure uh, that your refrigerant inside is at the correct levels and uh, top it off if need be, that sort of stuff. Make sure there's no leaks in your lines, that sort of stuff. So, you know, you want to have this usually looked at uh, once a year or so uh, to be able to get that, to make sure you're getting the most use out of your uh, air conditioning. So I'm going to pick on thermostats here real quick. Lots of different thermostats out there in the world. So another thing that, uh, I hate to say it, <laughs> another thing that happens a lot of times is you notice this is, is off, heat, and cool. Fan says auto and on. What people will do is they'll call somebody and they'll say, my air conditioning is not working. Well, this is the first thing you want to look at. I always start with the simplest thing. Is it on cool setting? So I can flip it to cool. And then is it set to a temperature, you know, below what the temperature in the, in the room is. So this is saying it's 70 in here now. It's set at 78. So if I want this to kick on, I'm going to have to get it down to 69. And then that thing will start to kick up. <laughs> and make a lot of things. So... That's, that's, you know, usually what you want to be able to do with that. You want to make sure that your, uh, your air conditioning is set to cool uh, and that it's the fan itself. Auto just means that that big blower fan is going to run only when uh, you're either calling for cooling or heating. This is where, depending on how it's wired there, let's say it's not necessarily hot, but you want to move that air around. What you'd want to do with that is be able to flip this over to on. And you should hear that you should hear that blower motor run. Your air conditioning's aren't running; it's just moving air. Now that depends on how it's wired up from the thermostat. So if that's something you want, and your furnace doesn't do that, when you have somebody out checking it, I'm sure they could probably uh, get that hooked up so that you're just able to run that. I think most of the the heating people set it up that way, but occasionally it's not. So that's one of those things that if you want that, that doesn't necessarily work ask them to be able to look at it they'll take a look and see so as far as the uh the air conditioning itself and how it you know how effective it is and everything else what it is off. as far as how effective it is and everything else uh it has a lot to do with the home itself uh, the home is um, insulated and how it's built. So what there is, is there's basically about three different styles of construction. And what I mean by that is I'm talking about air leakage as far as air moving in and out of the walls and the R value. The R value is the insulation, whether it's in your attic or in your exterior walls. So you have what's called loose construction homes. These are homes that a lot of times that are built you know, they're, they're much older homes. Uh, they may not have, uh, they may have insulation in the walls, but they may still have a loose construction. And what that means is that, you know, that air can easily move through those walls in and out and in and out, whether it's in through the attic or whether it's through penetrations or whatever. So that's a loose construction home. What that means is that you're not necessarily going to keep that cool air inside where you want it. It's going to leak out. So it doesn't leak out though. The hot air leaks in because it goes from hot to cold, but anyways. Um, and then you have what's called a tight construction. 
And what that is is that you're controlling that air movement. So there's uh, there's very little areas for that air to naturally move in and out of that structure. Those are your more energy efficient homes. And then you have moderate, usually somewhere in between. Most houses usually fall in that moderate range. Um, this is something, we'll talk about this a lot more in the weatherization and class and all that sort of stuff. But all this plays right along with uh, your air conditioning, just like your heat, you know. Uh, so a lot of people don't think of A, how their house is built, and then B, how it's insulated. Everybody thinks about insulation for heating and stuff. Well, it all works for cooling also. So you said, if you don't have good insulation in your attic, back to that drawing we were talking about in the first part, uh, yeah, that, that heat is gonna build up in that attic and it's gonna push right down into that living space and it's gonna get hot in there later in the day. So, you know, when you're talking about ventilation, you want to be able to ventilate your attic uh, to be able to get that hot air out. Because again, you can have the most energy efficient home, but if that attic builds up too much heat and you don't have good ventilation, it's just gonna work its way into your house. So yes, the, the insulation is an important part, but the ventilation in your attic to get that hot air out is also important. Um, as far as, I'm gonna make sure I'm not getting through anything. All right. As far as the other parts of ventilating your house. So remember we were talking about uh, an energy efficient home or a tight construction home. What you're gonna have is, remember I said that air does not necessarily uh, move out in and out of that house on its own. So what happens with a lot of your energy efficient homes is that you need to have, uh, you need to have mechanical means to be able to let that, uh, let that fresh air come in and not only the fresh air come in, but the stale air get out of the homes. You know, a lot of times the indoor air quality can be dropped pretty significantly just from, you know, living in the house, the items that are brought in, your cat, your dog, your pet snake, whatever, you know. So, I mean, all those things build up in the home. And in a tight construction home, they don't have a way to get out necessarily unless you're opening a window or a door. So, a lot of times what they'll end up doing is putting in what's called an HRV or an ERV, heat recovery ventilator or air uh, recovery ventilator. Um, heat recovery ventilator or energy recover ventilator it's been a while this is a box here that's usually put uh somewhere near the furnace uh it may be uh down in your basement or wherever and what this does usually has uh flexible pipe coming off the sides and what this is doing is is bringing in fresh air from the outside and it's running it through this box i'll show you what this looks like if i can pull this guy off so it's bringing in fresh air and it's gonna run through a little pre-filter and then a core like this. And then it's gonna be, that fresh air is gonna be put in, usually dumped into your, somewhere in your return air of your furnace. And then stale air from the inside is gonna be brought through, it's gonna run through a little filter here, through this core, and then it's gonna be sent to the outside. So it's basically like a set of lungs for the house. It's breathing for you, or it's, a, it's helping your house breathe. It's not part of your uh, air conditioning. It's not part of your heating. It is ventilation. So like I said, if you have one of these, generally the maintenance on this is, what you're gonna wanna do is about every 30 days, you usually have some kind of a filter like this. Sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it's a, uh, like a mesh style filter. Uh, you just pull these out, clean these off in the sink, dry them off, put them back in, you know? And then I'll say you usually do that when you're changing your furnace filter or about every 30, 30 days of operation. Like I said, this thing uh, is usually set at a certain rate that it's gonna run, depending on a few other things. The other part of it is this core here. So 
This core is a little different, but usually on the front, it's going to have instructions right here. It's going to say how often it needs to be cleaned, how it needs to be cleaned, and what you're going to be able to do to be able to clean that. With this particular one, what you can do is you can get it. Usually there's a handle right there. I can pull this out. And this one's metal. So this one is designed where I can wash this in the sink. Not all of these are that way. Sometimes it's what looks like paper. So this is where it's very important to read on the front. It will say the core. Uh, it's very important to read how it needs to be cleaned. Sometimes it's just a shop back or something along that line where you're just cleaning that stuff out. Um, sometimes it's a, you can wash it in warm water or something along that line. So it's real important to do that. Generally, you clean this core usually about once a year. Now, if that's something you're not comfortable with, again, when you have the furnace people come out to be able to work on, make sure they know if you have an HRV or an ERV, and you can ask them to be able to do that. But really, it's pretty easy. So like I said, usually, uh, I think with most of them now, they're like a paper core, and you can clean it off with a, uh, like a shop vac or even your vacuum cleaner or something along that line do that once a year and what that does is it makes it so uh the heat that is traveling through there yeah sure i can put it back in the heat that's traveling through there is going to be able to be transferred and i'm not going to fight with this right now there it is so what happens what happens with this is like i said the air never mixes so that let's say it's summertime and you have 90 degree air coming through and you have 70 degree air coming in uh, from the inside of the house. That air never mixes. But what it does is inside this core, it transfers that heat back and forth. So from that hot to cold. So it's you're not bringing in super hot air or in reverse, you're not bringing in super cold air. It's that it's dumped into the furnace filter or into the furnace, usually return air. So it can be tempered at whatever whatever way it needs to be done. Um, if you have one of these, it's usually a very there for a very good reason. Uh, usually if these things are not maintained, uh, the indoor air quality suffers pretty badly. Um, so it's one of those things that <laughs> if you have it, it's there for a reason is mo for the most part. And the maintenance on it is relatively simple. They said those little pre-filters and cleaning out that core once in a while, making sure that when uh, people come out uh, to be able to work on that furnace, that they understand that you have one of these. And if they look at it and they go, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to deal with it. You may want to think about finding somebody else. So keep that in mind. That's HRV, ERV, set alongs for the house, helps that ventilation stay nice and uh, keeps your house in good shape. So there's other parts of ventilation uh, that I want to talk about also. So one of them is your bath fan. So most of the time, uh, most people have a bath fan. Okay. Where it's vented to is very important. A lot of older houses i gonna pick on this over here again. A lot of older houses, what they end up doing is they end up dumping that uh, air. They'll have a little pipe, and it will just dump that air into the attic space. That's not a good thing. Um, the reason for that is generally when you have that bath fan running, you're running that bath fan to be able to get that warm, moist air out. This is more of an issue usually in the winter. But what happens is, is if that bath fan is not being vented out one way or another, it's just building up more moisture in that attic. Uh, in the wintertime, it's going to condensate and freeze on the underside of your roof deck. It can cause major problems. It's slow progression, but one of those things that you want to make sure that uh, if you have a bath fan and you have access to be able to look and see, uh, make sure it's getting vented out. Now, a lot of times, sometimes what they do is they'll, They'll connect them to what's called a roof boot. And I'll have one over here where that warm, moist air is vented out that way. Sometimes 
It runs out a uh, uh, gable end. Sometimes I've seen it where sometimes they're popping out in your soffit area. So there's a couple of different ways where they can do that. Um, a lot of times the easiest way to do is just be able to pop your head up in that attic and look and see. Uh, this is a this is a hood vent or I'm sorry, a roof vent. So usually they're a little smaller than this. Bath vent connects up to this and when it kicks on, this opens up and lets your warm moist air out. If you're not sure, like I said, you want to get, you know, if you want to take a look up in there and see, uh, sometimes they're buried in insulation. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit of a trick to find. Um, sometimes they may look like something like this. So let's say they're running out a gable end, meaning the flat end of your roof. You're looking at it. And, you know, what you can do is say, all right, I don't know if this is hooked up, but, well, I'm going to kick my bath fan on. And if you see these little parts here opening up, and then when you shut it off, they close. It's a pretty good indication that your bath fan is uh, that way. You know, so like I said, there's a couple of different ways that it's venting out. The other thing that happens a lot of times is that you a lot of times may have depends. You may have flex line like this where it's connected. It's usually like a four inch line. And they may connect flexible like this and run it, say, underneath your insulation or whatever. Um, what can happen over time is that people get up in that attic and they step on this and they squash it. Uh, I've seen it where birds get in there and peck away at it and everything else. So, you know, if, uh, if your bath pan is not, you can't figure out where it's being vented to, um, try to find it and see if it's something that's damaged. Like I said, it can be crushed. It can be a lot of different things. Um, but you usually want it to be, um, like I said, vented to the outside and the pipe itself to be in good shape. Uh, again, if it's, if it's squashed, if it's uh, picked apart, if it's falling apart, whatever, it is just not doing its job. And it's actually going to cause more harm by getting that warm, moist air out of that bathroom, but then stumping it in your attic. So not a good thing. So that's part of that ventilation that you want to think of uh, as far as making sure that bath fan is venting properly. So I was talking about the ERV or HRV. So sometimes where it's bringing in that fresh air from the outside, you may have something that looks like this on the outside of your house. It has little fins on the side and bottom, solid on top. And what this is, of course, I can't pop this thing off. There it goes. Is actually an intake vent. So it's pulling in air through these grids. And that air runs through this little screen and then runs to wherever and usually runs to something like this. Uh, it can run to something else too, and I'll get to that in a minute. But if you don't have, if you have one of these and you haven't looked at it ever, gently pop this thing off and you can do it just by a little turn. And what you wanna look at is this screen right here. What happens a lot of times is this little screen, ooh, can get totally clogged. And if this is totally clogged, you're not bringing fresh air in. So this may be all in good shape, but this is what's pulling in all that fresh air. So generally, if you're, if you're working on cleaning out your core, usually once a year, you're gonna want to be able to check wherever this is pulling that fresh air from. And if it's something like this, you can pop that screen out, take a little clean, clean it off, stick it back in, Sometimes that screen may even need to be replaced, but uh, yeah, you can you can get in there, and you want to make sure that screen's in good shape, because again, you don't want bugs and everything else getting through there too. And then when you put this back on, what you're going to want to do is kind of line it up. You want this solid piece on top, clicks like this. This way, water doesn't get in here, but it can still pull in 
fresh air from around the sides. You may have one of these that uh, if you have a basement, I'm going to bring this one up. Uh, you may have one of these where it connects to a larger flexible line like this, say, and it's running from your rim joist. And then this pipe is running like this and it just may be hanging a couple inches from the floor. Um, that's what's called combustion air. Same deal. You know, a lot of times if, you know, if you, especially if you had siding or something else we'll put on like that, you're going to have something like this. So usually if you see something like this, it's an intake of some sort. Um, and you want to be able to make sure that stays clean and that it can pull the air in that it needs to. So, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's usually another a good in here. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, a lot of people say, well, which one is, you know, from the outside, which one's from, <coughs> from the inside and which one's from the outside? Well, a lot of times when you're cleaning this pre-filter, if you're noticing a lot of bugs, that's usually it may be an indication that that something like that screen is ripped or something like that. And it's sucking in whatever from the outside. And sometimes that's a little indicator that you may want to check that um, with that HRV or ERV. So the other part with your bath fan, and I'm picking on bath fans a lot because actually that moisture uh, that's in uh bathroom uh bathrooms and stuff is actually pretty uh detrimental to the health of the house uh, that warm moist air can really cause a lot of problems so we were talking about the bath fan we we're talking about it venting to the outside not in your attic the second part of all that is you have what's called a squirrel cage so what this does is when you turn that motor on that motor spins this around and it's pulling that air and it's moving it hopefully to the outside what happens and i'll pick on this guy here what happens with this over time i don't know if you can quite see this or not is you get build up you get build up of old oh, lint and toilet paper lint and whatever else and what it does is it slowly closes up that that space to be able to move that air and if this is totally clogged up you can have the greatest bath fan and it could be vented out correctly and everything else, but if it's not moving air, it's not doing its job. So what you want to do, how do you check your bath fan? You should be able to get two pieces of toilet paper, kick that bath fan on, be able to put two pieces of toilet paper up against that fan and it should hold that while that fan is running. If it's not doing that, something's not right. Either A, the venting is not right as far as the, you know, the, the, it's squashed in the attic or something along that line, or this is clogged up. Uh, what you can do is a lot of times it has some kind of a cover. You can easily pull that down and uh, make sure it's turned off and you can get up there with like compressed air or an old cruddy paintbrush or something like that and clean these off once in a while. And that'll make it so that that air can move through and be able to actually get that warm moist air out of that, uh, out of that bathroom. So, some little simple tricks that you want to be able to do to be able to make it so that uh, that bath fan is actually working because that is actually a very important part of your ventilation of your house. The other part that is important is your hood vent. So this is a couple of different styles of hood vents out there. This is what's over your range, a range vent. Um, there, there's ducted and then there's non-ducted. So how, how do you know which type you have? Generally, if you turn it on and you can feel air uh, blowing from the unit itself back in either in your face or up above or something like that, that's a non-ducted system. And all it's doing is pulling air and just doing this, circulating it through. Um, about all it's doing at that point is really kind of just running it through that little pre-filter and catching the grease and whatnot. That's about all it's going to do at that point. If you have a ducted one, I said it's ducted in a lot of ways, similar to how the bath fan's ducted. It's usually, uh, it can be vented out the gable end. It could be vented out a roof vent like this. Um, it could be vented out a couple of different ways. Um, and again, you know, uh, the moisture and whatnot that's created uh, from cooking can be pretty significant, especially if you have a tight construction house. 
This is where if you have a hood vent, uh, you want to make sure, A, it's vented to the outside if it is a vented or a ducted style hood vent and that it's actually working and that you are doing uh, the maintenance on that really is, is usually you have uh, some kind of a screen or something along that line. You can see this style right here just written up. Uh, you have some kind of a screen that's uh, able to catch the grease and whatnot. And you clean those out once in a while. It depends on how much greasy food you cook and whatnot. But uh, you want to make sure that that is uh, cleaned out. You have to think about your hood vent. If it's a ducted hood vent, even if it's not a ducted hood vent, as part of your ventilation system for your home. So the other styles of air conditioning that are out there are window units. So a lot of people have simple window units uh you know that they'll put in hopefully they're putting that window unit in uh you know when it starts to get warm outside so when you're installing that window unit first thing you want to make sure is that it's got a little bit of a tilt to the outside the reason is is that you get condensation uh off of that a coil we're going to go back to this here in a second talk about that a little bit more but you get condensation you get moisture build up and it needs to be able to drain towards the outside of the house and drip out the back of that unit. I've seen it where people throw that uh, window unit in and it's either dead level or pitched a little bit towards the inside. And that water runs and starts dripping right underneath your window. And that's not good. So if you have a window unit, yep, make sure you have just a little bit of a tilt to the outside so that water is going to be running outside if you're running it you should be able to go out there and take a look at it and it's dripping off the back end or whatever um there are drain holes in there so a lot of times what happens especially if they've been old you know been around for a little while you have little drain holes in there and they get clogged up with you know crud and whatnot so you want to make sure that uh those are clear sometimes you have to look for them and use old toothpick or whatever spray it in there something to be able to make sure that's cleared out to be able to get that moisture out because again you don't want that bulk water running inside to your house the other thing with window units is uh you have uh filters with these and the filter is similar to what we were talking about but usually it's uh, some kind of a mesh style uh filter and that's usually right behind this panel this is the filter right here and that's usually in front of that a coil what's actually doing the work as far as cooling that house down uh and again you know if that furnace if that filter gets clogged up yeah that that air conditioning is just not going to do the job that it needs to be able to do so you know generally what i'm going to do when i install these make sure they're tilted a little bit to the outside make sure they're draining good clean that filter or replace that filter sometimes that filter just gets old and starts falling apart and you may have to go to the, the store or whatever and buy uh, a new filter for it. So you want to make sure that those are running. Can they be serviced? Yeah, they can. Um, sometimes you can lose refrigerant. Uh, that, that would be a question you'd need to ask somebody. You, you, it's not like you can just go out and buy refrigerant. You have to have a license and all that sort of stuff. It's not necessarily quite like your car. Um, and you don't know even know what type of refrigerant, either whether it's in a central air unit or a window unit or something along that line. And sometimes for somebody to actually go through and figure out where uh, the leak is and everything else, you spent uh, so much money on it, you could buy a whole new window unit. So this is one of those things that, can you fix it? Yeah. Is it affordable to fix it? Mm, sometimes not. Uh, you know, if it's a refrigerant issue or a compressor issue, and that compressor is actually that motor that actually moves that refrigerant uh, throughout that system. The other style of uh, cooling is what's called a heat pump. Uh, in a sense, it's a heat pump. So you may have a unit that looks like this on the outside. It's usually a unit there about, eh, usually about this wide. You're not looking. They're usually about, eh, say this wide like this, usually about this tall. And what those units do, in a sense, it's it's the heating and it's the cooling. So it flip-flops back and forth. Um, 
but a lot of the same rules apply. You want to keep them clear of debris and everything else. You want to keep them clean. Uh, you don't want to be bending these copper lines that are coming out of them, you know, because you'll have you'll have refrigerant lines going in and out of those things, uh, usually on the backside or whatever. And I've seen it where people actually come in and hit them with weed whackers or hit them with their lawnmowers or whatever. So you got to be gentle with those things. Um, but yeah, if you have a unit like that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with one of those. And then a lot of times they may, it may just have this on the outside. You may have a unit like this on the inside. It may, like you said, this, this is, uh, you're seeing more and more of these, but if you have one of these generally, like I said, it is your heat system and it's your cooling system. It just flips back and forth. So like I said, it, usually the higher efficiency phone homes are going to have something like that. They're going to have just an air handler inside to be able to do that. So you have a lot of different ways of air conditioning. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let's see. All right. So I'm going to pick on this A coil in here. So if I were to open this up, which I can't really do, um, you're going to have what's called an A coil in here. And this is, it's going to sit kind of like this, right? And it's going to look, it's going to look similar to this, just smaller. And it's going to be in an A frame or an A structure. And like I said, that air moves through that thing. What happens is, is that the warm, moist air hits that cold uh, A coil and that air is being cooled down. Uh, the byproduct of that is condensation or moisture. And so what happens is, is that you have this area right here is letting condensation come through and either run to a floor drain. So you may have a pipe like this run along and zip it over to a floor drain somewhere. And that's fine. Or you may have your a pump like this on the side. And what this does is it it's a float pump, so that condensation, that moisture fills this bottom up, little motor kicks on, this pipe runs to a floor drain or a, a mop sink or whatever, and empties it out, and then that motor sits there and shuts off and waits to be filled it back up again. So if you have one of these, this works in your heating, and this also works for your cooling if you have central air. So, um, you know, if you notice that you have a big pool of water sitting there, same rules apply uh, as far as your heating system goes. Sometimes all it needs is a little wrap on the side, and it's enough to be able to kick that motor back on, but sometimes this thing needs to be replaced out. So, like I said, this is your uh, condensation pump. Some people call it a little sump pump on the side. But yeah, you know this uh, this is one of those things that's going to move that moisture out if you're not draining it down into the floor or something along that line. Um, as far as the refrigerant goes, uh, like I said, you know when they come out and they do that maintenance, um, they're going to be checking that refrigerant. If you have an older unit, sometimes their older refrigerant is actually expensive. You know, they sell it per pound, basically. And sometimes, if you have an old unit that's running like a tank and it needs to be topped off, you might be surprised on how much you're actually paying for that refrigerant. And sometimes, it's almost better just to switch over to a more efficient unit. So, that's where um, what you want to do if you have... Let's say you're thinking about getting central air, replacing your central air, or something along that line. Uh, you really want to talk to that heating person and make sure they size it correctly. So we talk about that as far as sizing the furnace for the house so it doesn't short cycle. Kick on, kick off, kick on, kick off, and it slowly uh, self-destructs that furnace. Well, the same thing can kind of happen with the air conditioning as far as, you know, you don't want that thing short cycling because it's not necessarily going to cool your house down if it's too large what happens 
too, is it doesn't have time to pull out that humidity out of the air. So if you ever walked into a house, and sure, it's cold in there or cool in there, but it's kind of clammy, it just means they drop that temperature without pulling that humidity out. And it usually means that conditioning unit, air conditioning unit is too big. Uh, ideally, it's going to run, uh, it's going to usually run a little bit longer, so it works on pulling that humidity out dropping that dew point down and then making it more comfortable in the house. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, whoever's putting that in understands that most of the heating people do nowadays, but the, you can still run into that. So, you know, bigger is not necessarily better, especially when it even comes to air conditioning or even heating. The other thing is this, um, if you're, Let's say you watch and you, you want to work on the energy efficiency of your house because you understand that, uh, you know, all this stuff that I do to keep the heat in my house and all the stuff that I do to make my energy bills lower, all this works with air conditioning also. So sometimes what can happen is, is that you can have, you know, the size unit put in that you need because you may have a loose construction home, say, and, you know, they have to put a little larger unit in because... You're going to lose it all because your insulation is not there. Your ventilation is, eh, you know, you, you have air moving in and out no, with uh, no real control. Um, what can happen is, is I've seen where people get a brand new air conditioning unit in and then work on that weatherization. And all of a sudden, that unit now is too large because they've tightened up that home, whether it's caulk or foam or insulation or whatever. And, uh, so sometimes working with an energy rater or something along that line, they're going to be able to say, Hey, you know, if you do this and this and this, you're going to make it so that you don't need such a large unit. And you can, you know, a lot of times if the, if the heating person's a good one, uh, they're going to be able to understand that you're going to be able to take calculations and make it so that it actually fits, uh, the, the efficiency of your home. So. And this is one of those things we could keep going on and on about, but it looks like we're just about up. So we got anything else? We had, is it six? Is it? No questions? No harassment? It's amazing. <laughs> I can harass you. Oh. Ask away. I have no questions. All right. All right. Give it to those guys. I think we're done. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Technical difficulties. What are some ways of keeping a house cool without air conditioning? Well, ventilation. I mean, you know, you can move that air around. So we asked, you know, how can he, if you don't have air conditioning, how can you make your house cooler? Well, by just having, you know, decent insulation uh, in your attic and in your sidewalls and stuff like that, it's going to not let that warm air, whether it's in your attic or in the outside, move through and warm that house up. Um, Closing your blinds, that sort of thing. You know, if you have south-facing windows, you're going to get what's called solar gain. Uh, this is, you know, that 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 uh, that light traveling through that glass and heating up the inside. So closing blinds on south-facing windows or west-facing windows sometimes uh, is helpful. Um, like I said, running that if you have a basement, say, a lot of times your basement's going to be a lot cooler uh, than your upstairs. So what you can do is you can run that fan just on that on position where it's not running the air conditioning or it's not running the heat. It's just moving that air around and picking it up and be able to move it around. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's where the insulation and that sort of stuff. And then that, 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 uh, that simple things you can do as far as the energy efficiencies can make it so that uh, a house is much more tolerable. You know, we used to build houses when we built houses and we didn't have any air conditioning in them, but they're well insulated house. Uh, you know, it could be 80, 90 degrees outside and you walk in and that house is a good 20 degrees cooler 
and that's just because of the energy efficiency and how it was built and what the insulation was. So a lot of ways you can do it, but um, hopefully that answers your question. All right. I think we are out of time now. <laughs> I'm a gal of the way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor, for giving us really, really great ways and tips of how to stay cool this summer. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.